Get $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash gems and using gems at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast episode number 216. It is April of 2018, and in this episode, my interview with Find My Past CEO, Tamsin Todd, we did that out at Roots Tech 2018. Also, Military Minutes contributor Michael Strauss is going to shine a spotlight on women who have served in the U.S. military. Your DNA guide, Diane Southerd, is here to introduce the MyHeritage chromosome browser. And Genealogy Gems Premium Membership, just got a really big boost. So we're going to be talking about that. Let's see here. First up, well, in Genealogy Gems news, there has been a lot of news around here. Um, Since we last chatted here on the podcast, Bill and I survived the 15-hour flight to Sydney, Australia, and it, it was worth every minute of it because I thoroughly enjoyed my role as a keynote speaker at the Australasian Congress. This is the National Genealogy Conference. It's held every three years, I believe. 700 people filled the brand new International Convention Center on the beautiful Darling Harbor for four genealogy-filled days. So what did I love about the way the Aussies put on a genealogy conference? I've got five things that I love for you. Number one, everything was on the same floor. Walking was at a minimum. And if you have been to any of the national conferences in the U.S., you know that's not always the case. And it can really just spread people out, wear people out, and you end up not seeing as much as you would like to see. Well, they did a wonderful job. Everything is in one place. It was all carpeted and quiet and convenient and just lovely. Number two, the vendors in the exhibit areas had lots of space to visit with their attendees. It was kind of spread out, but amongst the classes, and there was one or two big rooms with exhibitors, and it just meant people had space to be able to chat and talk, and there was time to do that. Number three, they do high tea in Australia, and I love high tea. That was so fantastic. They would bring in big, beautiful pots of tea and cookies and crumpets and all kinds of little tidbits that were just lovely. And it's such a pick-me-up when you're at a conference like that. So uh, we need to be doing high tea in the U.S. That's all I have to say. Number four, the atmosphere was really upbeat. The organizers were very accessible and really helpful. And that just makes a difference. There was always somebody to turn to. If you didn't know where class was or you wanted to know what was happening, it was just a really positive, upbeat atmosphere. Very fun. People just seemed to be having a wonderful time. And that leads me to number five, which is the Aussies themselves. They are so approachable, kind, enthusiastic. What a great crowd. It reminded me a bit, not as rowdy, but it reminded me a bit of the genealogy jamboree that's held in Burbank, California. And maybe that's just that there was sunshine outside and everybody was in springy clothes. And, you know, for them, it was the end of their summertime. It just makes such a wonderful, upbeat experience. It makes a difference, doesn't it, when it's not pouring down rain and everybody's slogging around in sweaters and umbrellas. But the people themselves, so kind, so welcoming. It was just wonderful. So those are kind of my five things that kind of caught my eye about what I loved about the Australian conference. Now, the trick to attending a conference that might have a focus outside of your area of research, such as an Australian conference for an American like myself, it's really to listen for the principles, the strategies, and the rock-solid methodology. I tell folks that here about the podcast as well. Every once in a while, somebody will say, well, I I live in the UK. I I don't, you know, listen to the US things. And I'm like, 
Of course you should be, because it doesn't matter. I mean, there are unique elements, obviously, about any kind of record set around the world. But there's always tips and strategies and methodology that we talk about, regardless of which record we're working with. And so for me, I just think that's the key to always getting the most out of it. Even if it doesn't all apply, you know, you're going to be able to pull a couple of gems. If you have a good speaker, you're going to be able to pull some gems out of that. So I think that that is really the key, whether you're you know, reading articles, listening to podcasts or attending conferences, even if it's not in your neck of the woods, you're going to get something out of it. A lot of that has to do with you, right? And guess what? A Genealogy Gems premium member, Dot Elder, and her husband, Raleigh, they reached out to me to see when I was going to be coming to their part of the world, and they offered to be our guides in Sydney. So this was great. They met up with Bill and I at the airport. They got us to our hotel and proceeded to help us stuff as much of Sydney into our six-day stay as we possibly could. Dot, you are such an angel. I felt like we got to take in all the highlights. You guys were so organized from seeing the Sydney Harbor and the Opera House, the hop on hop off bus city tour, where you can kind of take in the whole city at large, dinner on the waterfront, looking out over the famous Sydney Harbor Bridge to, of course, famous Harry's meat pies that Bill was absolutely determined to get his hands on. And we did all of it without feeling rushed. It was just wonderful. I'm so lucky to have all of you Genealogy Gems friends out there. And a big hello, mates, to all of our new Genealogy Gems premium e-learning members who join us now from Australia. We are so happy to have you here. And of course, I have to share with you some of the personal highlights from our trip. So Bill and I jetted off to Cairns in Queensland, uh, just north, a couple hours flight north of Sydney. And we did that after we wrapped up in Sydney. And we stayed in a lovely condo across the street from the beach. It was wonderful. Um, A really quiet little lane. Now, the beach is in Queensland, at least where we were. They aren't very wide. Okay, this is not Clearwater Beach in Florida that we're talking about. However, this area is the gateway to some of the most amazing locations on Earth. First up was the 50-mile boat trip that we took out to the Great Barrier Reef. We spent the day with a group of really international tourists. We had people from all over the world on this trip out to the Great Barrier Reef, and we did snorkeling and snuba diving. Now, I'm saying snuba, not scuba. And that's because a snuba diving is the same concept, you know, and you put the thing in your mouth and you got the air hose, but you're not dealing with the big tanks on your back. And of course, you're not going down as far deep, but it looks to me like a boogie board, but it's got air tanks, I guess, in it. And so four people can hook up, grab one of these hoses and go down and and get the, the benefits of scuba diving, but not have to have all the training certification and all that. So they call it snuba, something they invented in California, as I understand it. And so that was great. And we, of course, soaked up lots of sun too. But you have got to check out the show notes page for this episode, because you're going to see a photo of my husband, Bill, with the famous fish, Wally the Humphead Rass. Now this fish is huge, and it's absolutely obsessed with selfies. He is determined to get a photo taken with everyone who dives in his neck of the woods, or should I say the sea. He was just a card. It was so funny. And he'd come over and kind of position himself for the photo with the whoever was scuba diving there. And the photographer would kind of like touch his nose and nudge him over so he'd get just the right angle. I mean, what a card. It was so funny. But this fish is huge. Absolutely huge. The whole trip was really a check it off your bucket list kind of experience. And we were just had a wonderful time. The other big thing that we did while we were in the area in the Queensland area was the sky rail ride. And this is sort of a ski lift where you climb inside one of those glass enclosed gondolas and you soar for an hour over the treetops of the area's rainforest. Now I have to tell you a little story that yes, reminded me of genealogy, because pretty much I can tie anything to genealogy if I try. (laughs) Now, we sort of just booked this Skyrail trip 
gosh, I think it was the day we got there. We didn't do any homework on it. I think we did it a day, our second or third day. So we get there and we hop into the gondola. And there were two stops along the way that you could make as you're going up this big mountain of rainforest. And you could get out and you could walk around the boardwalks they had kind of laid out that would take you into the rainforest without getting you completely lost and kind of get an up close and personal look at all the the vegetation and the animals. Well, the last stop on the gondola ride at the top of the mountain, if you will, was Karanda. And when you get out there, there's a nice little gift shop and there are some restrooms there. So we looked around and uh, we bought the photo that they took of us You know, when you're in the gondola and you're coming up and they flash and take your picture. And after about 15 minutes, we were pretty much done. So we climbed back in the gondola to go back down the mountain. And the guy says, oh, are you done already? Didn't you like Karanda? And I'm thinking, well, yeah, you got a nice gift shop. (laughs) There's only so many stuffed koala bears and boomerang refrigerator magnets that I need to look at. So yeah, we're good. You know, and of course, I just thought that to myself. I didn't say it. Well, he slides the door closed. He goes, well, okay, then. Well, come to find out that had we asked the obvious question, which is like, why did we miss something? We just we saw the gift shop. They would have told us that, yeah, there's an entire village outside the door full of restaurants and gift shops and a butterfly habitat and best of all, the koala gardens. So how does this tie into genealogy, you ask? Well, how many times do we go to an archive or a library without really doing our homework? We know what we want to find, but with a little more preparation and digging, we might be able to triple the gems that we come out of there with. And most importantly, if we just take a moment and we overcome our shyness and we share with the reference librarian or the archivist what our goals are and ask if there's anything that we should be aware of that may not be obvious to us, we again may have a whole new world opened up for us or a whole village. (laughs) Yeah, once we got home and we realized, we look at the brochure, we see, oh, there was a whole village we could have explored. I really did. Honestly, I immediately thought about how proper preparation, whether you're on vacation or you are going on a genealogy research trip, it always pays off. And you can't be shy. I, I think I felt silly. It was like, what? Did we miss something? I mean, I don't want to say something. I thought we'd seen it, you know? And yes, my friend, to answer your question, we did go back to Karanda. And this time we did it by car. It was a kind of a big, long, winding road up there. And we made a full day of it. And I even got to hold a cuddly, soft koala bear. Oh, to think that I would have missed that. So that was our trip to Australia. Now, the other news since, of course, the last time we spoke to each other is the week before our trip to Australia, we spent the week in Salt Lake City, Utah. And of course, that was at the biggest genealogy conference in the world, which is Roots Tech. And this year, it was a family affair at Genealogy Gems. We had Bill and my daughters, Lacey and Hannah, uh, along with the Gems family, Sonny Morton and Diane Southard. And we were really extra fortunate to have Michael Strauss, our military minutes guy, and our newest contributing blogger, Margaret Linford, with us. We met and chatted with thousands of you. We took loads of selfies with you, uh, signed tons of books, and we had a rousing good time. And we even, get this, dressed up in 1920s flapper attire, the whole kit and caboodle of us, when we went to the My Heritage after party. (laughs) It was so much fun. Oh my gosh, I had this red fringy flapper dress and the, uh, Lacey and Hannah each had kind of that, that Art Deco Cleopatra kind of looking, you know, 20s deal. And of course, Bill looked like he was going to hang out with Humphrey Bogart later that day. We had a wonderful time. So you can get a quick overview of what all that looked like by heading to genealogygems.com slash roots tech. And there you will see a quick overview of what we were doing at Genealogy Gems and also a quick overview video from FamilySearch covering the Roots Tech 2018 conference. All right, well, coming up next, we're going to hear what you've been up to. We'll do that in the mailbox.
Here in the mailbox, I have an email. It's from Holly. And she says, I really do love the podcasts, premium, regular and the family tree ones. I've listened to all of them. And I enjoy coming back to listen again. There's so much out there in the genealogy world to keep up with. And I was getting overwhelmed with trying to figure out what really were the best resources for me. She says, I work full time and I'm a wife and a mother. Oh my gosh, Holly, you are busy. I now use your podcast, website, and YouTube channel as my genealogy home base. And I explore resources out there when needed rather than trying to keep up with everything on my own. Oh, music to my ears. That's what we're all about, Holly. I'm so glad you feel that way. She says, your team really does a great job. They are awesome. And it's appreciated. I don't live in an area where family is from. So all of my research is long distance. And there isn't a large genealogical community here for me to network with. Genealogy Gems is my genealogy safe place and helps me feel connected. I've learned a lot in the last few years. And I've come a long way on my family tree. I credit that to the things that I've learned from Genealogy Gems, and I'm looking forward to spending time with the new premium e-learning offerings. Thanks for all your hard work. I love that. Genealogy Gems is my genealogy safe place. (laughs) I hope you all feel that way. (laughs) This is a place where you can come and you know that the stuff that you're reading about is stuff we've checked out, tried out, we love, and we feel like it's going to make a difference for you. So that's our goal. And of course, the premium e-learning that Holly is talking about is our really our latest announcement here at Genealogy Gems, which is that premium membership has kind of morphed and evolved into something bigger and even better, which is Genealogy Gems premium e-learning membership. We call it e-learning because it really is that learning place for you. It's it's like a learning academy or something, but it's not that formal. It's fun. It's at your pace, on demand, when you want to watch it, in the order in which you want to watch it. And that's why I finally took all of your wonderful advice that I've been hearing from so many of you saying, would you please give us a workbook, something that we could kind of go along with this because you don't always think to download or look at the show notes. And then you want to have a place to write what you're doing with your research with what you're hearing on the show or watching in a video. So we've published a brand new book, the Genealogy Gems Premium E-Learning Companion Guide. And this book is big. It's, It's over 300 pages. It's big. It is spiral bound so that you, you know, wire bound so that you can lay it out nice and flat on the table. And that is so you can use it as a workbook. Yes, we have spots on every single episode one through 100 of the premium podcast. And all of the videos that are currently on the website, we have all of the notes laid out for you. Um, And then there are spaces in each section for you to write. How did you apply this to yourself? Which websites do you want to do first? This is your book to really write in and work in alongside as you work through our our content. Now, our content totally expanded. So we uh, got together, teamed up. You know, Diane Southard has been your DNA guide here for years. She has recorded and we've produced over 21 of her DNA videos. There are more to come. And uh, the beauty of these videos is they are tackling kind of a tough topic. You know, I was in Memphis, Tennessee this weekend and we did a seminar. We had about 80 people in the room and I asked them, raise your hand if you have DNA tested. And I think almost every single hand went up. I said, okay, keep your hand up if you feel like you are getting what you expected out of your DNA results and you totally understand them. And all the hands went down. (laughs) I mean, without exception. And that is really the truth. What we're seeing and hearing from people everywhere is that they're kind of getting it. I mean, there are those geeks who just, you know, they're totally into it and they do it all the time and and they're snipping and doing all the wonderful little things that you can do with DNA. But your general person who has a life and a family and a job and, and other activities as well, they're not becoming, you know, a science major trying to deal with their DNA, but they really want to get the most out of it. And that's where Diane comes in because she can explain it so simply, fun, easy to understand, applicable to what you're doing. And the beauty of these videos that she's done is some of them, depending on the subject matter, she's doing some as full length one hour classes 
and some are five, 10 minutes long. And sometimes that's about all we can take, right? So you say, you know, I want to, I want to learn about the sharing tool. I want to learn about the one to many tool. And it's like, let's get a five minute hit the subject, get the gist of it. And then you stop and you go do it. And now you've got a companion book to make your notes, talk about how you're going to apply it, what you got out of it, and, you know, follow along, make it kind of work together as e-learning. I'm so excited about kind of this new format. I mean, in addition to, I think I have a 32 videos on there that I've done. We've got a video on there from Sunny about story. We now have 21 and various lengths from Diane. I think some of the ones I'm going to be doing in the future, you'll also see some kind of shorter chunk videos where you can take just that one topic, just that one piece of that topic, and then run with it and apply it and then come back when you're ready and do the next. I don't want anybody looking at premium membership and thinking, oh, that looks great. I, you know, I'll have to find time later to watch that if, if they're looking at our video. We really want this to be your go-to. And another way in which we'll help you go to it is in the way the book is laid out. So for the first time, we've taken that first one to 100 podcast episodes that are premium episodes. And because those are the older ones, we're up to over 200, 215, I think. One through 100 have been completely updated. So in the book, you have completely updated show notes. And that means all the websites, if something's been discontinued, if something's been added, we've put it all in there. And then at the beginning of the book, you've got a table of contents, something that's been kind of hard to pull off on the website, actually. And that is, you can go to the table of contents, and you can see each episode, and then it tells you what topics they cover. But even better is the video section, you can just scan through the table of contents because each video is on a single topic. And you can jump to that page and watch that video on the website in your membership. For the podcast episodes, we take it a step further and you can jump to the index of the book. And then you can look strictly by topic, all alphabetical. We've tried to focus it on the keywords that'll mean something to you. And you can scan through there, grab that topic, it'll tell you exactly which podcast episode it's in, and what page to turn to. I love it. I'm so excited. I have been hearing from so many of you who are already digging in and using premium e-learning in a whole new way. And in a way that's just really applicable to your research. That's our goal with it. And that is our big news. (laughs) So we're excited. We launched the book at Roots Tech. It is now available for the first time. Uh, You probably saw it in the newsletter. It's on the website. And you can get premium membership. And then you can decide if you want to add on the book to really make it even more personal to your research. Bring me a letter from my hometown. I know you spend a lot of time researching your family history, but you also spend one third of your life sleeping. So you should be comfortable. And that's where a Casper mattress comes in. Casper offers three comfy mattresses, the original Casper, the Wave, and the Essential. All three are designed, developed, and assembled right here in the U.S., The breathable design of a Casper mattress helps you sleep cool and regulates your body temperature throughout the night. And really, who doesn't need a good night's sleep? I sure do with everything I'm doing, and I know you do too. And these mattress prices are affordable because Casper cuts out the middleman and sells directly to you. They offer free shipping and returns in the U.S. and Canada. In fact, you can be sure of your purchase with Casper's 100-night risk-free sleep-on-it trial. That's 100 nights. So get $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash gems and using gems, G-E-M-S, at checkout. Take them up on their 100-night risk-free sleep-on-it trial. Again, get $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash gems and using gems at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. As I travel the world talking about genealogy, folks are always stopping me and asking for my advice on organizing and securing their family history research. And my standard answer is plant your family tree in your own backyard and share branches online. Planting your tree in your own backyard, it means keeping one master family tree 
in a software file right there on your own computer. That gives you ownership, control of privacy and security, and one central place to organize everything that you learn about your family. And of course, my software of choice and the one that I use is Roots Magic. I find that its tree building tools are second to none. And with Roots Magic Web Hints, you can see what record hints are available on Family Search, Find My Past, and My Heritage. And now you have the ability to synchronize your Roots Magic database with your ancestry tree and get those ancestry.com web hints right there inside of Roots Magic. These are features that are really critical and they're exclusive to Roots Magic. So plant your tree today in Roots Magic and watch it grow. Get started at rootsmagic.com. One of the great things about going to Roots Tech is I get to sit down and talk with some of the uh, top companies in the genealogy industry. So here's my conversation with Find My Past. I'm here with the CEO of Find My Past, Tamsin Todd. So nice to have you here. It's so fantastic to be here. It's exciting to have you at the helm of Find My Past now. And joining her is Ben Bennett, our friend here. And Find My Past is certainly one of what we call the genealogy giants at Genealogy Gems. And that's the idea that there are, you know, a handful of really big players in the record space and the search that goes along with records. And so our own Sonny Morton has been focusing on that. She's teaching on that here again this year at Roots Tech, back, back by popular demand. We love Sonny. Yes. Yeah, we love Sonny. And, you know, we published her quick reference guide, which I think has really opened people's eyes to the fact that, you know, it's not get one subscription and you're done. Mm-hmm. It's really about where you are in your family tree research. And that may mean some jumping around. And so it's critical if someone listening today hasn't visited Find My Past, that they get a chance to know uh, what that's about, what your vision is for it, and how that might play a role now or in the future in their own research. So tell us, how is it as CEO, and when did this change happen? I joined in September. Okay. Yeah, about six months now. Right. And were you already with the company at that time? No, I wasn't. I wasn't. And and, um, my background is digital products, um, consumer products, and I've worked in a few different industries. Um, So I am new to genealogy. I've been, you know, ramping up, talking to people who... Um, our expert and can you know bring to me the, the the weight of years of experience and it's just fantastic. I mean the you know find my past the, the richness of the records, the depth of, the depth of knowledge, the passion in the industry, mm-hmm. and I just I guess I just love the way that the industry brings together technology and data with this really human mission, right? To, yes. to, to discover more about your ancestors and also connect and collaborate with each other. And those two things together are really powerful and, and warm, you know, particularly for someone who's worked on cooler technology <laughs> products. And I, I just love that, that passion. You're in a yeah. very personal space. Yeah. You're, you're yeah. interacting with people yeah. sometimes at 3 o'clock in the morning at their computer, but That's in right. a very okay. personal way, bringing yeah. them their great-grandparents yeah. or great-great-grandparents. Parents. Again, you talked about getting familiar with the records. You must have a huge learning curve because I was going through Ben. You probably mm-hmm. saw this. You go through the bag and you see this stack yes. of flyers that were yes. not there. It has grown tremendously, which is great. Mm-hmm. And yet, it's a lot more for people to sift through. Yes. So now yes. they're not in the how do I learn this one thing or this one thing, but it's how do I make a choice and find what's right for me. Mm-hmm. I imagine one of your biggest goals will be differentiating by my past, explaining how and why people need you. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and definitely as, sort of a, as a new person in, in the industry and going much deeper, I've, I've found that, you know, that personally, I mean, where, where do you start, right. right? And everyone today, you know, whether, I mean, I never meet a retired person who isn't as busy as I am, right? right. So whether you're exactly. retired or whether you're, so, you know, yeah. you're, you're, you're working or whatever, everyone has a little, a little bit less time, right? So how do you get to that kind of relevance of discovery? You know, really quickly, it's definitely something we're thinking about a lot. Um, in uh, one of the things we're talking about here this week is our roots collection, which helps make it much, much easier to discover your transatlantic journeys, the journeys that your family made between the UK, between Ireland and, and Britain, and into the US. And you know, we have a hundred million names in there. And we've recently in the UK been, and, and like another angle in is talking about the. Um, 
with the suffragettes. It's been the anniversary of 100 years yes. since women, some women first got the vote in, in the UK. And of course, you know, the next couple of years we'll play that out in, in the US as well. And we were able to bring together, you know, a collection where people could go in and see if they had suffragette connections, but also learn about the history and how their family might have interplayed with the suffragette story. So it's exactly that. It, it's bringing the kind of data to, to life in different and really relevant ways. Um, and, and they're making that really, really easy for, for, for people to, to kind of access and make discoveries. To add to what Tamsin said, I think if, if people were to think about Find My Past, you know, differentiation is hard because the space is expanding. Yes. You know, I think to add to that, whether it's that British Roots collection or suffragettes, it, it's really if you have British or Irish ancestors, you sort of can't afford not to look at Find My Past. And, you know, we don't always, um, you know, sort of shout from the rooftops, but if we were to do that for a minute, I'd say, you know, most people don't know that we have more British parish records than any other company on the planet. Irish records, uh, which are typically hard to find, we have twice as many Irish records as the next nearest, you know, sort of genealogy giant. And people don't, you know, people don't realize that. And then you add on to that, uh, as Tamsin said, some of these other rich data sets like suffragettes and, you know, pieces like that. It's sort of anyone with family from the British Isles. We're really the home of British and Irish. And, you know, and at the same time, acknowledging that, you know, many Americans came from the British Isles, We've also spent a lot of time in U.S. records. So, for example, this week we'll be announcing more Catholic records, so 8 million more Great. records from New York. In the future, we'll be talking about Catholic records from Baltimore and Toronto and Cincinnati, things like that. That was a huge coup, really, for you guys. I mean, and it was just something that a lot of people have been waiting for. And it's, it's been a long time, yeah. How did that get on your radar? Well, it's um, you know, it's re- it's really funny. We, we, I was talking with somebody uh, last night about this, and they said, you know, when you're when you're working with archivists and working to get records, you don't just show up and say, I'd like to do this next week. It's oh, no, years it's a long and years, process. and you know this, and your audience <laughs> knows this. And so really it was. It yeah. was over a period of time maintaining frequent contact with a number of these uh, of the archdiocese. In fact, the Catholic Catholic Church has, had essentially said each archdiocese can make their decisions about access to their records. And I think it was I think it was a combination of you know uh, uh, some persistence on our part, but also actually an increasing of demand. Um, mm-hmm. People going to those dioceses and them really not having the resources to give people access to records and yet not wanting to say no. And right. so you know as we came in and said, listen, you know how can we help you solve this this problem? And and by the way, in some cases there were also some you know some records that were deteriorating. Um, oh, sure. And so you know you you start and you think about in this day and age a record in the United States being lost. I mean that just should never ever happen. But We're too so, young for that. Yeah, we are. We are. It's exactly right. And so, you know, it was it was really bringing those together, and and at the same time doing it in a way that was respectful of the of the Catholic Church and and you know of their interests. And so, you know, in some cases it it, it takes us a little longer, but it's also you know we're we're, we're building those partnerships for the long term. Uh, because we think that's going to give genealogists better access to those records and more records. And that's really the way it's worked. We originally made an agreement with the Philadelphia Archdiocese and then New York. And uh, the archivist at, at the New York Archdiocese sent an email out to all of her colleagues and said, here's what we're doing. We're doing. We suggest you follow suit. And, uh, you know, you Excellent. can't ask for more than you that. You cannot. Right? That's fantastic. Um, and we, we didn't ask for that, of course, but uh, really nice. And you've had your eye on the U.S. The last couple of years has been more of an emphasis there. And, of course, my listeners are very strong in Canada and mm-hmm. in Australia as well. And, in fact, I'm hoping after I go speak to them next week that we'll have a whole lot more Australians listening. How much can they find? What are they looking to find my past for? Because many, many of them have, of course, their connections back to the U.K. Yes, Yes. So, you know, Tamsin talked about that British Roots collection. Yes. Um, and what, you know, that was that was done. We started actually with the United States. And, and what we did is we looked at every record set that we have in the U.S. that might have any mention of the U.K. in it. So, for example, uh, you know, a, a typical user may not search California marriage records to find something about the U.K. But it turns out some of those records say the father was from England. Right? And so what we did is we took all of those records. We looked for any event or any mention of the of the UK put them into one record set so that someone instead of saying gosh it was California or it was Ohio 
it's all there and you can find it and say, okay, this person came from the UK, now we can bridge back into those parish records and some of those those other details. We haven't done that yet for you know for Australia, but it would be um, you know I, I, I think we have actually some similar resources to be able to do that. Sure. And so we're we're debuting that for the US. We'll have to see what's there, you know, what's there and, and do something similar for Australia. I think it'd be an interesting project. That's great. Yeah. You're moving into a new year. You're, you're ramping up with your knowledge base, Tamsin, and, and then you get to start really implementing your vision. I know everybody listening would like to know kind of why my past has been moving very quickly. Where do you see it moving to? So I think building on this this richness of the records and the British and Irish expertise that we've been, we've been talking about, and what we've been thinking really hard about is what today's user really needs and cares about and how we can take what we do best and combine that with some of the the themes that we hear from our customers and from people who are thinking about getting into family history. Make it easier. Make it easier for me to make discoveries. Let me find other people who are working on my family tree. I've actually had this experience in the last in the last few in few months where I I hit some blogs and actually you know through others who'd worked on it was actually my Canadian family oh, okay. back up you know was able to go you know hundreds of years back before Terrific. you know be, than I would have been able to uh, alone. So that that desire to collaborate, that desire to um, to share your finding with that with others. So we've been thinking a lot about that and. Of course about family trees and how they work because that's that's the place where you connect right that's the place where you collaborate we're thinking about how to do family trees in a way that brings together the expertise of, of genealogists who have rich and evidence-based trees that they might publish and want to share but who may not be as into the collaborative piece but to combine that that kind of um, established you know evidence-based tree with some of the knowledge of the community and, and sharing trees, and I guess again I've run up, uh, you know, against this in, in, in my early days. Is um, how do you know as a, as a as a newer person as genealogy? How do you know what's right and what's not right? I think it's actually terrific that you have someone from outside of by my past because I did that the other day. I went in and I jumped in for somebody, and I rarely get to do research for anybody else anymore, but I did a little something for a friend of our family. Yeah. And the experience from ground zero start yeah. has changed dramatically. I've been in this a while, so I'm not seeing this. I'm not experiencing this That's as right. an experience. That's right. But what you're describing, Tamsin, is that coming in from the beginning and then you see the tree and that can unfold things. Traditionally, at Find My Pest, you build trees, but they are not shareable. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to know kind of where that's going to go. And you talk about the evidence space. And, of course, everybody listening is cringing just a hair in that. Yeah, but they could put as much junk in my tree as they could put quality in my tree. And, of course, my mantra is these are clues. You still have to do your work, don't you? And that's what you're talking about is, wow, opening those kinds of clues for people. So where are trees going in Find My Cast? So what we're looking to do is to um, introduce a tree that's much more collaborative than what, we, the, the, what we're doing today. And that, that brings together the expertise that we have in our records and, and um, of established genealogists who have... Know, robust and, and, and researched trees along with a sharing element but not a sharing element that, um, that republishes error you know, constantly. Mm. We're, we're, we're looking for um, a model, and we're working on this. So right. we're not, you know, this isn't a product announcement. This we're sure. trying to do is to point. The there's probably going to have to be a lot of technology behind this absolutely. to make this really absolutely firm. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. You know, for example, how do you, you know, how do you determine if someone's a, you know, a, a, an early person, you know, like me, you know, maybe a, a year of genealogy behind them with, you know, a, a, a really Rich and researched tree, and how do you how do you use um, the collaboration of the community um, and maybe other signals as well to, to you know determine what gets more weight, what gets more weight in the tree that brings together the experts and the new users. That's interesting. Yeah. Signals, yeah. you know, as yeah. in like, wouldn't it be wonderful to clearly be able to identify 
right up front in a sense you get five stars if you've qualified with these items and one of them is you've cited your sources and you've got exactly. them linked yes yeah, like i can see you shaking that's exactly your head. <laughs> it's exactly right well yeah and and that i mean i think that's one of the things that's been great about tamson is is well while, while she comes in new to genealogy she's got a you know a background in in history and a love for history and yet comes in with this notion of how, how would you do this if you were to put the customer first and yes. work backwards yes. and then and then combine that with being sort of hands-on and having a product background you start to think very differently about trees instead of the way we've always thought about them in the past mm-hmm. and and you know we look at you look at you know these collaborative shared trees well there are some benefits in collaborative shared trees and yet there are benefits in these well-researched trees. And, and, you know, in the industry, it's this it's sort of this game about, well, it's one or the other. And, and I think part of what Tamsin is bringing is, how do you make that, that instead of an or, it's an and? How do you bring yeah, the best of really both worlds together? Yeah. yeah. So in product development, is kind of your, your strength, right? I mean, it's molding them into keep up with the times. Mm. Absolutely. So... so I've joined Find My Past at a great time in that um, there's been a lot of technology change at Find mm-hmm. My Past. We've done, a, I won't go into it, but a replatforming that gives us really um, state-of-the-art uh, technology that lets us iterate quickly and do all the good things that a technology company does and build new experiences and test them and so on. And we have a new CTO, and we have a new product leader, so you know, really you know, a, a good, strong new leadership team um, you know, combined with technology platform real focus on, on product as you say and um, and you know you know it's interesting I mean in, in some areas maybe we haven't moved as fast as we might but we also get to learn from everyone as well and that's one of the one of the benefits of being able to look and go well you know where are the gaps and the opportunities in product and where can we where are the, the customers whose needs aren't quite being addressed um, and that's a, you know that's a, a great thing as well this morning I taught a class for the first time a DNA class all right. I am not a DNA person. Uh-huh. I have the DNA person, uh, Diane Southern. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And so she and I collaborated because we talked about what happens when you find a best match in DNA mm-hmm. and they don't have a tree. And I showed them using my techniques in Google how to find a tree. Uh-huh. And of course, DNA is the hottest topic on the mm-hmm. planet. Who knows what it will be in three years mm-hmm. or what it will look like. So I'd be curious to know it's not currently as part of your product offering, but is that something that they'll talk, talk about? Because trees is an integral part of that, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And it will be a conversation we'll come back to later in the year. We're working on it and it's okay. something that we... So it's on your radar. You're thinking Act, about you know, it. You know you've got the records. Actively on the radar. Got and it. Like Tamsin said, we'll, kind of, we'll come back to it. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think one, of the, one of the things about DNA that I think we all have to ask ourselves is, is you know, how do you... Uh, there's some good work that's been done in DNA, but it hasn't really, I think, realized the, the possibility of connecting DNA and trees and that experience in a way that is meaningful. It's sort of, you go from this really easy experience in DNA to this really hard experience looking through tree after tree after tree and making decisions. Um, you know, and like you said, you have to do your own work, but how do you, how do, how do we bridge that gap and differentiate in that area? And that's, that's maybe why you've seen us, you know, be, be sort of, uh, you know, a, a little bit, a little bit sort of less likely to just jump in, but to actually stand back and say, what actually is going to make sense and really help customers? Those are your opportunity points, yeah. aren't they? And what's yeah. the find my past way of doing it, mm-hmm. right? You know, with our richness of records and British and Irish, we would want to do it in a way that, that builds on that and, you know, adds to adds to that, that strength and that expertise rather than being something on the side. So we're being really thoughtful um, about that. Well, it's interesting because the method I showed this morning was a, was a manual way to work through and make the connection that isn't happening automatically. And as I was working on it, I, I love being able to open that door mm-hmm. for people. Mm-hmm. And yet, I'm, I can see all the different technology opportunities there are yes. to automate yes. <laughs> so yes. many of the things I was showing them. I'm like, oh, if this could just be built in. This would be amazing. I hope your class was recorded. I'm gonna. It was okay, actually recorded. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> if you ask the question, what's the number one problem you have? The number one problem I have is I have a best match, and they didn't have a, a tree. tree. That's yep. it. That's and exactly that, it. And our our class was no tree, no tree, no problem. Yeah. 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 And we actually found That's one great. for somebody who didn't. And it's, it's excellent. I like that idea of kind of uh, those 
challenges are really actually the biggest yeah. holes and opportunities. Yes, yes. Yeah. To walk through and to help people get outside those boxes and work around them. And, um, and I feel sure that you guys are probably looking for those. Now, what else would you like to tell our wonderful Genealogy Gems audience right now? One thing I would say just in particular is if there was one thing that the audience could do is if you haven't added your tree, you know, even just a copy of your tree to find my past, you know, you're missing out. Mm -hmm. uh, I can almost guarantee that you will find data on Find My Past that you haven't found elsewhere. And the easiest way to do it, you can search if you'd like to, happy to have you do that, but the easiest way to do it is add your tree and then and then wait for those hints to roll in. Let the tree right? do some of that and work. let the tree do the work for you. Mm -hmm. Well, such a pleasure to get a chance to sit down and meet you Thank and you, talk with you and get you a chance to talk to all the wonderful people out there that uh, are absolutely passionate. Boy, if you think they're here at Roots Tech, we know they're all over the world, and this is just that tip of the iceberg, is it not? That's right. That's right. And thank you again, yeah. Ben, as well. well so thank nice you. to see you both. Yeah, likewise. We will, uh, be, keep an eye on Find My Past, one of the genealogy giants. Thanks so much. Thank you. MyHeritage.com is your home for global genealogy research. The site boasts the most geographically diverse membership in the world, with a strong presence in many European countries. Search for cousin connections worldwide among more than 86 million people on a site that operates in over 40 languages. Powerful proprietary search technologies at MyHeritage.com dig deeper and with greater accuracy into billions of historical records and online trees. This is the only major genealogy website that offers automated hinting on possible matches in digitized historical newspapers. And now MyHeritage offers autosomal DNA testing too. They're jumpstarting their DNA database by inviting members to upload their own and by sponsoring tests in certain parts of the world. I'm looking forward to the geographical diversity I anticipate from their DNA data. So head on over to MyHeritage.com and expand your global genealogy research. That's MyHeritage.com. Okay, have you visited Backblaze.com slash Lisa yet? If you don't have cloud backup for your computer yet, everything on it is vulnerable to loss. Your pictures, your master genealogy database, files for work, the everyday business of your household, losing all of that at once is as devastating as it sounds. That's why I did my homework and I found a cloud-based backup service provider. I chose Backblaze. It runs in the background 24-7 automatically saving copies of everything, including my precious video files. Did you know that some of the other leading services actually skip your video files when they do the backup? Hello, not good. And Backblaze is so easy to use. I love their free app that allows me to access all my files if I need to from my smartphone or my tablet. Most importantly, the service is totally affordable for real people. It's just $5 a month. So don't wait to ensure that all your files are safe. Do it now. Back them up like I do with Backblaze. Head over to backblaze.com slash Lisa and get that $5 a month deal. Check it out for yourself. You could even do a free trial. That's backblaze.com slash Lisa. Just last year, if you had asked me if I thought anyone could catch Ancestry DNA in their race to own the genetic genealogy market, I would have been skeptical. However, it is clear that MyHeritage intends to be a contender, and they are quickly ramping up their efforts to gain market share and your confidence. Hello, Genealogy Gems podcast listeners. This is Diane Southard, your DNA guide. My heritage began in 2018 by making a much needed change to their matching algorithm. Previously, it was full of errors and misinformation, but they were able to adjust it, and now it's humming right along, telling our second cousins from our fourth. Another development launched in February is the addition of a chromosome browser. What? 
is a chromosome browser. Well, much like you'd browse the library shelves for the perfect book or browse to the sale rack for a great bargain, you can use a chromosome browser to look through your chromosomes for the pieces of DNA you share with your genetic cousins. Chromosome browsers can be everything from a fun way to review your genetic genealogy results to a tool to assist in determining how you're related to someone else. Let's go over three tips to help you make use of this new tool. There are actually two kinds of chromosome browsers in MyHeritage, one to view only the segments you share with one match, the one-to-one browser, and a browser where you can see the segments shared with multiple matches, the one-to-many browser. To get to the one-to-one browser, head over to your match page and find a cousin for whom you'd like to see your shared DNA segments. Click on the button titled Review DNA Match, then scroll down past all the individual match information, past the shared matches and shared ethnicities, until you see the chromosome browser. To find the one-to-many chromosome browser, you can use the main DNA navigation menu at the top of the MyHeritage homepage. Click on DNA, then on Chromosome Browser. In the one-to-many chromosome browser, you can compare yourself, or any account you manage, to anyone else in your match page. To choose a match to evaluate, just click on their name and they'll be added to the queue at the top. Clicking on compare will then allow you to see the actual segments you share with each person. In this one-to-many view, each individual match gets their own line for each chromosome. Since we've added seven people to the chromosome browser in the image I chose, and by the way, if you want to see these images, just head on over to the Genealogy Gems blog and see the show notes for this podcast. There are several lines to each chromosome number on each of the images for the chromosome browser. Each match not only gets their own line, but also their own color. So you can easily match up the lines in the chromosome to the match that shares that piece of DNA with you. For the majority of people, the majority of the time, these chromosome browsers are just another fun way to visualize the connection you have with your DNA match. In the end, it doesn't matter where you're sharing on the chromosome, just how much DNA you are sharing. You can obtain that information from your main match page and never look at this chromosome browser image and still make fantastic genetic genealogy discoveries. Another feature of the chromosome browser on MyHeritage is the triangulation tool. To understand how this works, you first need to understand that you actually have two copies of each chromosome. You have two copies of chromosome 1, two copies of chromosome 2, etc. One copy you got from your mom and the other one you got from your dad. However, in the chromosome browser image, you see only one line for yourself in gray. Therefore, when you see someone matching you on chromosome 14, for example, you don't know if that person is matching you on chromosome 14 you got from your mom or the chromosome 14 you got from your dad. Likewise, if you see two people whose shared piece with you looks to be in the same location on the chromosome, you can't tell if they're both sharing on that same copy of the chromosome or if one matches is related to your dad's family and the other match is related to your mom's family. However, this is what the triangulation tool does for us. It tells us if two or three or four, etc. matches are sharing on the same copy of the same chromosome. In the image, you can see that MyHeritage puts a box around the pieces of DNA that are the same between both of the selected matches. Some genetic genealogists use these triangulated groups as evidence of a shared common ancestor between the triangulated individuals. However, this is not always the case, especially at the very low threshold my heritage has set as the default. More often than not, you share that DNA not because you share a single recent common ancestor, but because you all share a population group, like you're all Irish. So please be careful if you decide to use this triangulation tool in your family history. I think the very best thing that this chromosome browser can do for you is to get you back into your DNA test results, get you working on your match list, and sparking your curiosity about your connections. So get out there and give it a try. And if you have questions, you can always reach me at guide at yourdnaguide.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time here at Genealogy Gems.
Hello, listeners. We mustered in for another episode of Military Minutes with Michael Strauss. Last month, we explored the different military branches. It was men who primarily bore arms in times of emergency. However, not all women filled the traditional roles relegated to them by society. This month, we focus on the many contributions of those women who served in the ranks of the military. Now, from the days of the Revolutionary War, any woman who chose to fight would have had to have disguised herself as a man. This was the case of Deborah Sampson, who served under the alias of Robert Shirtliff until she was discovered and discharged. Other women, like Margaret Corbin, were camp followers and served by cleaning and cooking. During the Battle of Fort Washington in New York, her husband John was mortally wounded, manning his artillery piece. Margaret took his place on the gun, continuing the fight against the British. For both women, their sacrifice was not forgotten. Each was awarded pensions from the government based on their service, although Corbin received one half of the pension allowance because she was a woman. Later, during the Civil War, women again sought to join the ranks of the military. Take, for example, Jenny Irene Hodgers. She was a native of Ireland, enlisting in Company G of the 95th Illinois, where she served using the alias of Albert Cashier. Her identity was kept secret during the war. It wasn't until 1911 when a doctor discovered her actual identity. The turn of the 20th century had women more accepted in the ranks of the army. The establishment of the Nursing Corps in 1901 saw the first large-scale enlistments of women. Still later in World War II, with the forming of the Women's Auxiliary Corps, called the WAX, and in the air with the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, known as the WASPs. The other military branches took nearly as long to accept women in their ranks. The Navy, in 1908, established the Nursing Corps with their first enlistments. In 1918, Opa Johnson became one of the first women to put on the uniform of the United States Marine. Twin sisters Genevieve and Lucille Baker were the first women to join the Coast Guard in 1917. Like the Army's organizations, in 1942, the Naval Women's Reserve, known as the Waves, was followed shortly by the Coast Guard Women's Reserve, which was known as the Spars. Many of these women were relegated to nursing and clerical positions with very little opportunity for combat experience. It wasn't until World War II that larger numbers of women were sent into combat. In 1948, President Truman signed the Women's Armed Services Integration Act that allowed for the permanent presence of women in all the military branches, a tradition that holds strong. Today, the descendants of these early pioneers can look back to learn from their past experiences, striving for continued service to the United States for future generations. Last month, I shared a story about Russell Strauss, who served in the Navy during World War II. Now, one of his two sisters also served. His younger sibling, Catherine, served in the Army. She was trained as a nurse before the war. Catherine joined the Army in 1943, serving in the Nursing Corps, being commissioned a first lieutenant. She was sent overseas 34 times, stationed on board a hospital ship, where she cared for the sick and wounded that were removed from the combat zones in France and Italy. With the end of the war in 1945, she was discharged and resumed her nursing career until her death in 1972. Now, researching the women in our families during wartime can offer the chance to find gems that might otherwise go unnoticed. Now, listeners, you're dismissed until next month when we will again muster in and discuss photographs of our military ancestors and where to find them. Often, when all we have is an image of them in uniform and nothing more. Until next time. Profile America, Friday, April 13th. The American automobile industry began to take off this month in 1913 as Henry Ford set up the first moving assembly line in Highland Park, Michigan. Before the assembly line, workers spent over 12 hours building a single Model T. Afterward, it took only 93 minutes. Ultimately, a new car came off the assembly line every 24 seconds, and 15 million were built over the years of production. Prices dropped too. 
In 1909, a basic Model T Roadster cost $825. By 1925, it was down to $260. Now, American automakers, Ford still among them, of course, manufacture close to $130 billion worth of vehicles annually. You can find more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau online at census.gov. Well, we've come to the end of another podcast episode. To find the show notes page for this episode, just head to genealogygems.com and go to podcast, Genealogy Gems podcast. Click through to episode number 216. And of course, if you're listening in our Genealogy Gems app, which I hope you are, you'll find the show notes there as well. Thank you to my podcast production team. The content team includes Sonny Morton, contributing editor, with additional content by Your DNA Guide, Diane Southard, and of course, our Military Minutes expert, Michael Strauss. Hannah Fullerton uh, edited today's show, and our service manager, Lacey Cook, keeps everything humming behind the scenes and fields your questions and emails. We've been busy here at Genealogy Gems producing out those videos that we recorded at Roots Tech. So check those out. You can watch them for free over at youtube.com slash genealogy gems. We are so close to 10,000 subscribers of our free Genealogy Gems YouTube channel. So if you haven't done it already, do that for me, will you? Please click the red subscribe button. Get us to 10,000. All right. Thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.